My name is Carl Svartsko. In 1990, I was a fed up school teacher and decided to open a little antique shop in my hometown, Gothenburg, Sweden. After a few years, I met Günther, a picker who drove around in a fire track, buying old furniture, windows, and so forth. In May 1994, Günther asked, Do you want to buy a scarecrow? He had visited a farm the day before and seen a hand protruding from among the rakes and shovels, leaning against the hayloft walls. According to the farmer, the appendage belonged to a wooden figure used as a scarecrow about 100 years ago. The only thing Günther could distinguish in the darkness was that the hand appeared well carved. No one had ever tried to sell me a scarecrow before. After some anguish, I made an offer through Günther to buy it. A few weeks later, he asked me to come to his farm and see my purchase. Günther had a strange sense of humor. That evening, when I pushed open the heavy barn door, I saw through flickering candlelight what presumably was the scarecrow. It was hidden under a thin blanket. Mozart's Requiem streamed from loudspeakers. Hesitantly, I walked to the figure to uncover the blanket. What was I going to see? The experience was unreal. When the figure's intense gaze met mine, the world stood still as questions whirled in my head. Who are you? Who made you? Where did you come from? Careful cleaning revealed fragments of gold leaf around the waist and ruffles on the right sleeve. This was no common scarecrow. The rounded base reminded me of a ship's figurehead. Could it be? A curator at the Maritime Museum confirmed that the wooden lady had once grazed the prow of a merchant ship. The hole in her stomach was for the drift pin that fastened the figure in place. Her hairstyle and narrow-waisted dress were high fashion around 1850. There was often a connection between a ship's name and its figurehead. Consequently, if I could find out whom the figurehead represented, I might be able to determine which ship she came from. While browsing literature, I came upon references stating that the likeness of Jenneline sometimes appeared on 19th century figureheads. I decided to find out what she looked like. Could the scarecrow be one of the figureheads depicting the Swedish opera singer? Of the many reproductions of Jenneline, the most convincing was an engraving of a dramatic scene from Meyerbeer's Robert le Diable. They corresponded down to the finest detail. The scarecrow represented Jenny Lind. In the 1800s, the gifted Swedish soprano Jenny Lind ruled the European stage with a remarkable vocal range and tune. She was the first megastar, the Victorian version of the Beatles. Hearing of the singer's fame in Europe, New York impresario P.T. Barnum organized an American tour in 1850 that catapulted her into international stardom. When Jenny arrived at the New York harbor, more than 30,000 people were gathered. Barnum met her with flowers and escorted her down the gangway. Her first performance in the U.S. 
was at the Castle Garden near Battery Park in New York City on September 11, 1850. Some 7,000 viewers attended. Janeline Fever hit America through the 20 months that the singer toured the country. This, the first tour made by a European artist in the USA, was a tremendous success. Crowds mobbed her wherever she went. People put Jenny's name or image on everything. Towns, schools, furniture, cigars, sausages, locomotives and ships. From the register cars at the Maritime Museum in Gothenburg, I learned that six ships were named Jenny Lind. All had sunk far off Sweden's coast. One of the ships on the list was the American clipper ship Nightingale. She was famous for carrying a beautiful figurehead of Jenna Lind. The middle 19th century was a peak period of American clipper ship production. The clipper ships were the fastest sailing vessels the world had ever seen, long and lean, with sharp bows, raked masts and a cumulus of sail. Samuel Hanscom Jr., a shipbuilder in Elliot, Maine, had heard Jenna Lind sing and named his new clipper Nightingale after her nickname, the Swedish Nightingale. The ship was adorned with a finely carved figurehead of the singer. On 16 June 1851, two months before the schooner America inspired the launch of America's Cup race, Nightingale slid into the Pascatacqua River. Her story would be as romantic and exciting as anything in marine fiction. Built as the first cruising yacht to carry passengers across the Atlantic to the Great Exhibition in London and then to be exhibited in the Thames. Nightingale was, therefore, fitted out regardless of expense with large saloons and most luxurious cabin arrangements. Unfortunately, her owners fell short of money before she was completed and the clipper was sold at auction in Boston. Nightingale did not go to the Great Exhibition, as did the schooner America, but sailed on a maiden voyage to Sydney. She was the first ship to set sail with American gold diggers to this remote part of the world. Nightingale left Australia for China. For a decade she took part in the famous tea race to London. Nightingale was much admired for her beauty and was considered by some contemporary authorities to have been the fastest vessel in the American merchant marine. In February 1860, Nightingale was sold in New York to Francis Bowen, known as the Slave Prince. Under his command, the ship sailed from Cabinda, Angola, to Cuba, with 2,000 Africans in irons. In April of 1861, the Nightingale was spotted by the USS Saratoga, an American warship. Captain Bowen and his crew were taken prisoners and the ship was sailed as a prize boat back to New York. Because there was no defense, it was decided that Nightingale would be sold at an auction arranged by the military. Nightingale was purchased by the United States government. During the Civil War, she was fitted as an armed cruiser for the Federal Navy. After the war, Nightingale continued in trade between New York, San Francisco and China. In 1876, she was bought by Norwegian ship owners. On March 17, 1893, the Nightingale was abandoned in the North Atlantic at the ripe old marine age of 42. Depressed, I looked at my scarecrow. If the information that the ship sank in the Atlantic in 1893 was correct, then how could her figurehead be in a barn outside Gothenburg? I felt a glimmer of hope when I read that Nightingale's last home port was Kragere in southern Norway, a day's sail from Gothenburg. I contacted Jimmy Olsen, a reporter for the newspaper Westmar in Kragere, hoping his readers could help solve the mystery of how the figurehead ended up in a Swedish barn instead of at the bottom of the Atlantic. An old man informed Jimmy that one of Nightingale's deckhouses was on Kirkholmen Island off Kragere. Olsen contacted Anders Thomasson, the owner of the island. Thomasson told him that in 1885 Nightingale's bow was severely damaged when it hit a reef near there. 
A ship was towed to the yard on Kirkholmen for repairs. The stone wharf was the spot where the nightingale was anchored. In order to make a larger hatch, one of Nightingale's deck houses was removed and placed slightly behind the shipyard. A sloping roof added to the deck house protected it from the elements, enabling it to become the only one existing from an American clipper ship. The deck house was almost empty. The beams in the ceiling and the panels on the walls were original, as were most of the floorboards. The big house at the old shipyard held more traces of the nightingale. The railing on the second floor landing was a banister from the interior of the ship. In another part of the house, a length of the deck planking with inscriptions, perhaps made by slaves, was saved. The daily log was preserved from the time renovations were being done on the Nightingale. Here we can see each worker's name and salary. Around 1890, approximately a thousand Swedes lived in Kragere. Some were only seasonal employed and Swedish names were registered in the log. While repairing the bow, it was necessary to remove the figurehead and it was put on land. The Nightingale sailed her last seven years without any ornamentation on the bow. Anders Thomasen had heard this story from his grandfather, the last of the relatives to run the shipyard. It is believable that some of the Swedes that joined the craftsmen took pity on their countrymen and took her home after finishing their work. How did the figurehead end up in that barn 30 miles from the sea? Finally, the eldest man on the farm remembered something. As a little boy, he had heard that a relative bought the figure after it was taking off the ship in Norway. It had been on a large ship that went across the Atlantic. With that, the loose ends came together. In the spring of 1893, when the Nightingale sank to the bottom of the Atlantic, the ship's figurehead, Jenna Lind, was going full speed ahead, scaring other nightingales in a field in western Sweden. The main railway between Gothenburg and Stockholm, the same route as at the end of the 1800s, runs close to the field. The figurehead was presumably transported from the harbour of Gothenburg by train. When illuminated by moonlight, the scarecrow scared not only birds but people too, so it was relegated to the back of a loft and forgotten. A color analysis showed that Jenny has been painted approximately 25 times in white and light yellow. Some details had been painted with different blue paints and had even been gilded. Blue and yellow were Swedish colors. A wood analysis determined that the figurehead was carved in eastern white pine, the same species professional woodcarvers in the northeastern United States used for their figureheads. A bullet hole, 9 mm wide and 4 cm deep in Jenny's chest, could well have come from the time of the American Civil War. An oil painting by James Buttersworth, depicting Nightingale getting under way of battery in New York. The painting is a symbolically composed motif, with the sight of Jenny Lynn's American debut in the background. Battlesworth showed a three-quarter size figurehead with both arms outstretched. The 
The left sleeve of a scarecrow's dress had three rows of ruffles. The right had four. The left arm was anatomically incorrect. It was too stout. The left hand was not carved with the same accuracy as the right, and the fingertips protruded awkwardly. The waist on the left side of a dress curved softly upward, precisely the way fabric would fall if the arm were held straight ahead and upward. The arm was a replacement. Everything indicated that the right arm, still the original, had also been outstretched initially, although not as much as the left arm. It made sense that the outstretched arms had been, over time, given a safer position. Who carved Jenny? Books on clipper ships state that Nightingale's figure was lifelike, beautiful and well carved. Remarkably, there is no information revealing the woodcarver's name. Clipper ships launched in the Pescataqua River carried figureheads made in Boston. John Mason was often called when human-like figureheads were needed. He attained considerable fame and many considered him to be America's foremost sculptor. Suddenly he was a logical person for the task. His twenty or so surviving drawings are at the Peabody Essex Museum. Mason's figurehead sketches titled Belly of the West Left and Woman with Crown Right compared to Jenny. The way Jenny was carved is identical to the sketched figurehead's long beautiful neck and the nose with a classic slight angle protruding from the forehead. Mason may have worked from the same basic pattern as he created his proposals for these figureheads. Revel Carr, former president and director of Mystic Seaport in Connecticut, says that there is certainly the stylistic similarity with the belly of West drawing, particularly the point where her body meets her skirt. John Mason is indeed the likely artist, and Jenna Lind is probably his only extant carving. An article published in the Boston Daily Evening Traveler between 23rd of December 1850 and the 21st of September 1853 describes Nightingale. It states, The figurehead is a finely carved figure of Jenna Lind, painted white, set off with gilded ornaments. In the right hand, which is extended, is a gilded bird representing the nightingale with half-spread wings. A reconstruction of the figurehead shows Jenny Lind urging the nightingale perched on her finger to fly off and sing for the word. To keep the original figure unrestored, it underwent a process of computer scanning and CNC cutting to produce a second figure. The British carver Andy Peters recreated the original position of Jenna's arms and carved the nightingale. As I painted the replica, I followed the colors in the first layer of paint on the original Jenna Lind. Jenna's face from the reconstructed figurehead was digitally imposed upon this Swedish 50 crown note. Nightingale's figurehead in the center of often published portraits and reproductions depicting Jenna Lind. In 1996 the figurehead was unveiled by King Carl Gustav XVI at the National Museum of Fine Arts in Stockholm.
Standing to the side of the figurehead, the American and Swedish Yenelin scholarship recipients Maureen Francis and Camilla Tilling performed a cappella from Jenna's repertoire. A couple of weeks after this event, Jenny was on stage at Stockholm's Concert Hall in connection with a concert performed by the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. In 1997, the Nightingale figurehead was a symbol for the Katisak tall ships races in Gothenburg. In May 1998, Jenny appeared in National Geographic. In 2001, the figurehead was on stage during a Janelin concert at Portsmouth Music Hall, New Hampshire, to mark the 150th anniversary of Nightingale. From 2002 to 2005, Jenny was on full-time exhibition in the figurehead room at Mystic Seaport Museum, Mystic, Connecticut. In 2006, the wooden lady was on display at South Street Seaport Museum in New York City. A complete account of my search for the figurehead's identity is chronicled in the book Jenny Lind and the Clipper Nightingale Figurehead. Very few actual parts remain from American clipper ships. Nightingale's Jenna Lind and Great Republic's Eagle are the only two figureheads sailed from extreme clipper ships, the Greyhounds of the Sea. Jenna spent 34 years at sea, while the Eagle never saw the sea because of a destroying fire before the ship's maiden voyage. The Nightingale figurehead is the finest tribute to Jenna Lind and her time in America. In addition, it is one of very few artifacts existing from ships fighting under the flag of the northern states in the Civil War. It is also, perhaps, the only existing carving from the approximately 40,000 slave ships that transported captured Africans across the Atlantic in the days of the slave trade. Ironic is that Jenna Lind, who during her tour in America gave away money to organizations combating the slave trade, ended up on a slaver. Because no other figurehead from an American clipper ship has been found during the last 75 years, it seems logical to assume that the Jenilin heroine from the Nightingale was the last carving from these remarkable vessels to be discovered. But never say never. A hot tip for Günther is to begin searching for traces from the clipper Witch of a Wave which end her days in Norway. The ship's figurehead, carved by John Mason, surely stands in some Norwegian or Swedish barn. The question is, which one? I thought about providing Günther with diesel for his track. <laughs>